Hey again, everybody. All right. In this lecture, we're going to cover textbook section 4.7, which is inverse trig functions. And this shouldn't be there. It does not have solutions. If you don't have these notes in front of you, please refer to the link that you got for this video. The, um, the link for the notes should be right below it. Okay, so we're going to look at the inverse sine function, the inverse cosine function, and the inverse tangent function. And there's some cool uh, notation for these things. The obvious notation for the inverse tangent is a negative one exponent, so inverse sine but there's also a very um, well used and very common alternate notation, which is arc sine, arc cosine and arc tangent. So we have inverse tangent of X and arc tangent of X. We're going to um, sort of summarize everything and then look at some composite functions. So sometimes we, we, we want to go backward. We know the answer, but not the question. And in order to answer questions like that, we want to be able to go backward. But the trig functions are all periodic. Absolutely every one of them is. That means that no trig function is one to one. Every single periodic thing fails the horizontal line test. So our first goal is going to be finding a reasonable natural domain restriction on first the sine, then the cosine, and then the tangent so that what results will be one-to-one. -one. So the first thing, let's consider the sine. So we've got y equals sine x and x equals sine y. If y equals sine x is 1 to 1, then x equals sine y will be a function. But notice that x equals sine y is not a function because y equals sine x is not 1 to 1. We're crossing one, two, three, four. Every single horizontal line that touches the curve will cut it an infinite number of times. So let's look at the sign. Is there a natural place that we could cut it? Like remember when we had x squared, When we had x squared, we cut the function right at the zero x value. So we said that x was going to be greater than or equal to zero, and we would only consider the right branch. That's a natural domain restriction. So for the sine function, here's the sine function. What is a natural domain restriction? Well, let's look at this. If we start at negative pi over 2, I see that I have every single value for the sine. So I'm going to start at negative pi over 2 and run through positive pi over 2. Now I have every, I have all the negative values for sine, all the positive values for sine, and if I cut x equals sine y at the same place, I get a function. So our natural domain restriction for sine is going to be, we're going to let x be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. 
which means basically we're just looking in the fourth quadrant and the first quadrant. So let's draw a sketch of what the inverse of the sine function will look like. This point negative pi over 2 comma negative 1 will become negative 1, let's see, negative 1 I think is right above pi over 2, negative pi over 2, there we go. So negative 1 comma negative pi over 2 should be about here. This is negative 1 comma negative pi over 2. And then we have the point negative pi over 6, negative 1 half. So I'm going to go to negative 1 half. Oh, negative 1 half. Here we go. Negative 1 half, negative pi over 6. Let's see. So this is negative 1 half, negative pi over 6. The point at 0, 0 will stay 0, 0. Because if we switch the order, it's still 0, 0. Now this point at pi over 6, comma, 1 half will become one half, let's see, here's one half, comma, pi over six. So one half, comma, pi over six. And finally, the point at pi over two, comma, one will become one, where is it? There it is, comma, pi over two. So that the inverse of the sine looks like this, which is not a beautiful picture, but I do have a pretty picture of it just a few pages away. Let's go ahead and look at it. Here we go. So here's the invertible sine. This with a domain restriction. And here's the inverse sine function. And you see it goes from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 in the y direction and between negative 1 and positive 1 in the x direction. Exactly the reverse of what we started with. One really helpful way to think about the inverse sine function is to take the values that we know for sine. Like if I plug in negative pi over 2 into the sine, I know I get negative 1. Well, I'm going to take this and just flip it. If I plug in negative 1 to the inverse sine, I'll get negative pi over 2. Since the sine of negative pi over 3 is negative square root of 3 over 2, then the inverse sine of negative square root of 3 over 2 will be negative pi over 3. The inverse sine, well, since the sine of pi over 6 is 1 half, the inverse sine of 1 half will be pi over 6. We're going to use those values, and the unit circle, we're going to look at the fourth and first quadrants. So quadrant one and quadrant four. And do you see that we're looking at quadrant four from the point of view of the positive x-axis? So we're going clockwise into quadrant four, counterclockwise into quadrant one. And we want to find the inverse sine of negative one half. Let's see. Let's find a place where the sine, remember sine is y, 
Let's find a place where the sine is negative one half. Here it is. The sine is negative one half. What angle is that? Negative pi over six. So this equals negative pi over six. We're taking the answer and getting the question. Here the answers are all gonna be angles. Where is the sine equal to square root of two over two? Well, if it's positive, I know I must be in quadrant one. Negative, I must be in quadrant four because there are no other quadrants involved. So I'm, I'm going to look for a place where the sine, the second coordinate, is square root of 2 over 2. There it is. So the arc sine of square root of 2 over 2 must be pi over 4. I want you to use these same... No, oh, this is... This should be 1 half. This, this question should have been arc sine of one half. So this is part B. So I want y'all to find the inverse sine of negative one and the arc sine of one half. And let me pull the unit circle down so that you can see it. And I'll give you a few minutes. Or just pause the video. Okay, great. Now let's consider the cosine. Here it is in all its glory. Y equals cosine X and X equals cosine Y. If Y equals cosine X was a one-to-one -one function, then we'd flip it, it would be a function. X equals cosine Y would be a function. But I can see this does not pass the vertical line test, and y equals cosine x does not um, pass the horizontal line test. So our question is, what is a natural domain restriction for cosine? It's not going to be negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 like we had with the sine, because we only have positive cosine values in those two quadrants. So what we're gonna do is start at zero and go up to pi. Because cosine has all of the values that we need, positive and negative, between zero and pi. So here it is. Here is the part of the cosine that we want to use. It starts at 0, 1, then we have pi over 3, 1 half, pi over 2, 0, 2 pi over 3, negative 1 half, and finally pi comma negative 1. To get a sketch for the inverse cosine, we're going to flip each of these coordinates. So my first point is going to be 1, 0. And I think 1 is just below pi over 3. It's 1, 0. It's there. And then my next point is going to be 1 half pi over 3. I'm taking this point pi over 3, 1 half and flipping it. Let's see. If this is 1, here's about 1 half, and I'm going up to pi over 3. So here's my point, 1 half pi over 3. Now I want 0 comma pi over 2. Well, this is interesting. There is 0 comma pi over 2. And then negative one half comma two pi over three, negative one half comma two pi over three, and finally, and I think it's not going to be quite on this graph, finally we have 
the point pi comma negative 1 will become negative 1 comma pi. So let's see. This is about negative 1 comma pi. And you see we get something like that. It's a weird looking graph. And the pretty version, let's see if I can go right, there we go. The pretty version, here's the invertible cosine, so the domain restriction on the cosine. And here is the inverse cosine, which we were just talking about. And you can sort of see that our graph is this graph, it's just not as pretty. All right. So we're going to use the same things that we looked at with the sine. We've got all of the, the typical values for uh, that we plug in to graph the cosine. We just flipped them. So 0, 1 becomes 1, 0. Pi over 3, 1 half becomes 1 half pi over 3. We just took every single coordinate and flipped it. And another thing that we're going to use a lot is the first two quadrants of the unit circle. So here's quadrant one, quadrant two. And unlike with sine, where we would went counterclockwise if we had a positive sign and negative, or, or clockwise if we had a negative sign, here we're going counterclockwise in both cases. So where is the value of the cosine negative square root of 3 over 2? And I'm remembering that cosine goes with x, the x coordinate. So I'm going to look. Since this number is negative, I must need to go to quadrant 2. So let's go to quadrant 2. Do we find a place where the x coordinate is negative square root of 3 over 2? Hey, there it is. So the answer is going to be 5 pi over 6. And I wanted to put this one example here that is a non-example or, or an answer, unanswerable question. What is the very largest value that we ever get for cosine or sine? It's one or negative one, right? The very largest is one, the very smallest is negative one. So can we have an answer that is bigger than one? So since negative 1 is less than or equal to cosine of x is less than or equal to 1 then arc cosine of 1 point it doesn't matter how many zeros we have is undefined I want y'all to do these two questions Find the inverse cosine of negative one half and the arc cosine. Remember, these mean the same thing. The arc cosine of square root of two over two. And let me get this zoomed out so that you can see the questions and this unit circle at the same time. All right, go ahead and pause the video and do that problem. And then we'll pick up right away. Very good. We had to do um, that video on graphing the quotient functions because a really, really important question is the inverse tangent. Tang and we'll see that more as we progress during this week coming up. So let's look at the tangent function. So here it is. y is equal to the tangent of x. We've got vertical asymptotes at negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And at every odd multiple of pi over 2. 
and the graph gets asymptotically close to this pi over 2 coming from the right and coming from the left asymptotically close to negative pi over 2. Is this function f of x equals tangent x 1 to 1? Well, let's just see. Let's take just a typical lying around horizontal line. Oh, I can see that even with this small graph, I'm already crossing more than once. So certainly tangent, none of the trig functions are one to one. And we can see that in that x equals tangent y is not a function. Okay, so those questions are the same. And now our, our whole goal is to find a reasonable, natural domain restriction for tangent. Well, it's kind of more obvious with tangent than with any function that we're going to start at negative pi over 2 and go to positive pi over 2. But here, unlike with sine, where we went all the way to negative pi over 2, and all the way up to pi, uh, pi over 2. Tangent does not reach there. So we're going to limit x to above negative pi over 2 and up to positive pi over 2. So the open interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So I've got my tangent function. Let's see. This vertical asymptote at pi over 2 will become a horizontal asymptote. y equals pi over 2. The vertical asymptote at negative pi over 2, this is the equation x equals negative pi over 2. This is the equation x equals positive pi over 2. x and y flip. So this becomes... The, the horizontal line y equals negative pi over 2. And that helps us a lot. We can see that the inverse tangent is going to be between these two horizontal lines. Now let's find some of these points. 0, 0 is going to stay Pi over 4, 1 will become 1 comma pi over 4. Negative pi over 4, negative 1 will become negative 1, negative pi over 4. And we get a function that looks very much like what I just drew. And unlike with sine and cosine, the inverse tangent goes on forever. Let's look at a prettier view of that. Here is the invertible tangent. And I can see that this function is going to go up to infinity and down to negative infinity for these y values. And that means it really makes sense that the arc tangent or inverse tangent will go, will have x values all the way from negative infinity to infinity. And the range, the y values, will be constricted between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 and we'll have horizontal asymptotes. Let's sketch those in. Okay, great. Well, just like before, we're going to find values for the inverse tangent or the arc tangent 
by taking the things that we know about the tangent and flipping it. In other words, negative pi over 4 negative 1 becomes negative 1 comma negative pi over 4. Negative pi over 6 negative 1 over square root of 3 becomes negative 1 over square root of 3 negative pi over 6 and etc. And we are really going to use this 1 4 unit circle. So a unit circle with just quadrants 1 and 4 showing. Again, we're going to go clockwise into quadrant 4 and counterclockwise into quadrant 1 because in quadrant 1 we're go looking at positive angles in quadrant 4 we're looking at negative angles. So let's answer these questions. What is the inverse tangent of negative square root of 3? Since the angle is negative, I know I must be in quadrant 4. So I know I'm in quadrant 4. And I remember that tangent x is equal to sine over cosine. Okay, so tangent is sine over cosine. If tangent has a square root of 3 in the numerator, it must have come from the sine. So this must have been square root of 3 over 2, 1 half. But which one was negative? Well, in quadrant 4, which I know we have to be, we don't have any other choice if the tangent is negative, then it must have been the sign that was negative. So I want to find a place where the sign is negative square root of 3 over 2, and the cosine is 1 half. Do you see that if we had this fraction, negative square root of 3 over 2, comma, I mean, divided by negative, divided by 1 half, that would be the same as negative square root of 3. So if I had negative square root of 3 over 2 divided by 1 half, then I got rid of my inside fractions, I would have negative square root of 3 over 1, which is the same as negative square root of 3. So which angle gives me this value? Well, there's just one place where the sine is equal to negative square root of 3 over 2 and the cosine is 1 half, and that is negative pi over 3. The other way that we can do that is by looking at these values for tangent and going backward. So the tangent is equal to negative square root of 3 if we start with negative pi over 3. Okay, what about the arc tangent of 1? Since I know that tangent is sine over cosine, The tangent will only equal 1 when the sine and the cosine are the same number. Since this number is positive, I know I have to be in quadrant 1. There is no other option. So I know my angle is in quadrant 1 since 1, this number in here, is positive. Well, in quadrant 1, where are the sine and the cosine the same? Right here. So pi over 4 must be the answer. The arc tangent of 1 is equal to pi over 4. I want y'all to answer these two questions. Find the inverse tangent of 1 over square root of 3 and the arc tangent of negative square root of 3. And use this um, unit circle to do that. So go ahead and pause the video and do those questions. And then we'll keep going. Okay, great. 
On page eight of your notes, there are the three natural domain restricted uh, sine, cosine, and tangent, and their inverse functions with the domain and range of both. So this is a page that you might want to print out. All right. Just looking at, at how things work, if the sign is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, then the arc sine and the sine cancel. The same thing with the cosine. If the cosine is between 0 and pi, then the arc cosine and the cosine cancel. They are inverse functions. And again with tangent, if the tangent is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, then arc tangent of tangent is just x. And then we can go the other way around. But always, the sine of the arc sine is just x, cosine of the arc cosine is just x, and tangent of the arc tan is just x. So let's look at these values. We want to find exactly the arc cosine of the cosine of 3 pi over 4. And my first question should be, is 3 pi over 4 in the domain of the invertible cosine? Well, let's see. Here's my invertible cosine. And 3 pi over 4 is in this domain. Yay! So that means that the arc cosine and the cosine will cancel, and we'll just get 3 pi over 4 out. Well, let's do that in two steps to see it work in slow motion. In other words, let's do the inside part. Let's find the cosine of 3 pi over 4. Let's see, the cosine of 3 pi over 4. 3 pi over 4 is in quadrant 2. I've got a denominator of 4, so I know it's 1 over square root of 2, or square root of 2 over 2. Is cosine positive or negative in quadrant 2? Exactly right. So the first step is that the cosine of 3 pi over 4 is negative square root of 2 over 2. The arc cosine, remember that's the same as the inverse cosine of negative square root of 2 over 2. Well, let's see. If we have negative square root of 2 over 2, that's exactly 3 pi over 4. And I'm kind of kidding that I can see that. I just know. And I can use the unit circle to do that if I go backward. So since I can find a cosine, here's one, negative square root of 2 over 2 is the cosine, so it's the answer, and that's what our cosine is starting with, the answer and finding the question, the angle, and the angle here is 3 pi over 4. So since 3 pi over 4 was in the restricted domain of cosine, the arc cosine and the cosine cancel, and we're left with 3 pi over 4. If we do it in two steps or one, it doesn't matter. We're going to get the value that we start with at the, as an answer. Well, what if something isn't in the natural domain restriction? Is 2 pi over 3 in the restricted domain Of sine. Oh, here they are. So here's my sine. It starts at negative pi over 2 and goes up to pi over 2. Oh, 2 pi over 3 is greater than pi over 2. So since 
2 pi over 3 is larger than pi over 2, I'm, I'm out, I'm beyond the first quadrant. So for sine, I only go to the first quadrant and I stop. If I'm going to look at negative values of sine, I have to go backward into quadrant 4. So now let's just use the unit circle to find the sine of three pi over two pi over three. So let's see. Here we go. Here's two pi over three, and the sine is square root of three over two, the y coordinate. So sine of two pi over three is square root of three over two. Now the arc cosine is limited to the first and fourth quadrants. It's positive. That means I'm going to look in the first quadrant. Where is the sine, the second coordinate, where is the sine equal to square root of 3 over 2? Oh, here it is. Pi over 3. So the arc cosine, pardon me, the arc sine of square root of 3 over 2 is pi over 3. And notice that we did not get the same angle. We plugged in 2 pi over 3, we got pi over 3 out. And that's because 2 pi over 3 isn't in our domain. I want y'all to do these two questions. And remember, Sine with a negative 1 is inverse sine. It's the same as the arc sine. And inverse cosine is the same as the arc cosine. Go ahead and pause and do those two questions and then pick up again. Okay, great. Sometimes we're given nice, complicated functions. So here we're looking for the tangent of the arc cosine of negative 1. Oh my gosh. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this inside bit and set it equal to theta every single time. Every single time. So we've got theta equals arc cosine of negative 1, and we're trying to find the tangent of theta. Because we let this whole thing be theta, we're looking for the tangent of theta. Ah, but I know something lovely. I can take the cosine of both sides of this equation. Let's write it over here. Look, we've got theta equals arc cosine of negative 1. Cosine is a function, so I can take it of both sides. The cosine of the arc cosine is just what we have. They cancel each other, so the right-hand side is just negative 1. So, in other words, what angle has a cosine of negative 1? Well, in case you didn't remember, let's look at our unit circle and let's find a place between quadrants 1 and 2 where the x-coordinate is negative 1. And there it is. So, the cosine of pi, the cosine of pi is negative 1. So, I know theta is equal to pi. And now my ultimate question is, here, sorry, theta is equal to pi. And my ultimate question is, what is the tangent of pi? Well, let's see. Here's pi. I know that tangent is sine over cosine, so 0 divided by negative 1, and that's 0. So the ultimate answer is 0. 
Well, let's do kind of a backward question. This time we're given cosine of arc tangent of negative one. So we're gonna start with theta equals arc tangent of negative one. And this time we're gonna take the tangent of both sides. Tangent of theta, tangent of arc tangent, and the tangent and the arc tangent cancel, and we're just left with negative one on the right. So in other words, what angle between negative pi over two and pi over two has a tangent of negative one? And that's kind of easy. Negative one means the sine and cosine had to be the same, except one was negative. So that's at negative pi over four. So here, theta is equal to negative pi over four. And our question was, what is the cosine of negative pi over four? Oh, let's see, where is my unit circle? Here it is. So I've got negative pi over four. Cosine is the first coordinate, so square root of two over two. So this is square root of two over two. I want y'all to do these two questions. Find the cosine of the arc sine of negative one and find the tangent of the arc sine of negative square root of three over two. And I don't know why this is here. Okay. I'll take care of that in your notes before you see them. So please pause the video for a moment so that you can do these two questions and then we'll pick right back up. What if the number that's being plugged in is not one of the nice values from the unit circle. Like negative four over nine is definitely not in the unit circle. What do I do then? Well, the same thing we're gonna do to start, we're gonna set theta equal to this parenthetical part. So I'm gonna have theta equals arc cosine of negative four over nine. And I'm gonna take the cosine of both sides because I wanna undo this arc cosine. So cosine of pi, cosine of arc cosine. On the right side, the arc sine and the cosine cancel, and we just get negative four over nine. So we have the cosine of theta is negative four over nine since we have to think of invertible cosine and this is negative, we must be in quadrant two. So I'm gonna draw a triangle in quadrant two. And I know that the cosine of the angle is negative four over nine. Let's see, cosine is x over r, or we can write it adjacent over hypotenuse. Uh, so I know the hypotenuse is always positive. The radius is also always positive. So I've got r equals nine. And x must be the negative thing. So I've got x equals negative four. And to find opposite side, or y, we just use the uh, Pythagorean theorem. So I know x squared plus y squared is r squared. So I've got nine squared is negative four squared plus y squared. y squared is gonna be 81 minus 16, and that's 64. So that means if I take the square root of both sides, y is equal to either positive or negative square root of 65, but I'm in quadrant two. In quadrant two is y positive or negative. Very good. That's right. So we get that y, our missing side, 
is equal to positive square root of 65. And now let's go back. What were we ultimately looking for? The sine of theta. Do you see how this works? We take this mess in the middle and just replace it with theta so that all we're trying to find is the sine of theta. We've got all three sides of our triangle, so we can easily find the sine of theta. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, or y over r, so it will be square root of 65 over 9. So again, what we're doing is we're taking this bit inside, setting it equal to theta. Since it's the inverse cosine, we're taking the cosine of both sides, so we get cosine of theta is negative 4 over 9. And then we draw a triangle in the correct quadrant and find whatever we were ultimately looking for, which is sine in this case. But wait, there's more. Let's find the exact value of sine of arctan of negative 2. So we do the same thing. I'm going to take this inside bit and set it equal to theta and write my equation. Theta is equal to the arc tangent of negative 2. I want to take the tangent of both sides of this equation. On the right side, tangent and arc tangent cancel, and I just have negative 2. On the left side, I've got the tangent of theta. This is a negative tangent, and since I have a restricted domain, anytime we're looking at inverses, we're restricting our domain, that means that we this angle has to be between the fourth and first quadrants. It's negative. So theta must be in quadrant 4. There's no other possibility. So I'm going to draw my triangle in quadrant 4. And let's see. I know that the tangent of theta is negative 2. I could write negative 2 over 1. But I have to be careful. I'm in quadrant 4. So let's see. I've got x, y. I know tangent is y over x. Hey, this is all right. I can let, I can do it straight across. I can let y be negative 2 and x be 1. Very nice. So now, let's find the missing side. We know that x squared plus y squared is r squared. We have 1 squared plus negative 2 squared. Well, that's 1 plus 4. That's 5, and I know that that's r squared. So that r must be positive or negative square root of 5, but radius is always positive, therefore r is equal to positive square root of 5. Now I've got all three sides of my triangle. Now, what was I really looking for? The sine of theta. The sine of theta. Well, let's see, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, or we could write it y over r. So it would be negative 2 over square root of 5. If you were doing this problem for me, this is a wonderful, beautiful answer. If you're doing it for connect math, then we have to rationalize. So we have the sine of theta is negative 2 over the square root of 5. That means I need to multiply numerator and denominator by square root of 5. In the numerator, I get negative 2 square root of 5. 
and in the denominator, square root of 5 times square root of 5 is 5. So the final answer is either sine theta is negative 2 over square root of 5, or sine theta is negative 2 square root of 5 over 5. There are several questions that I want y'all to do, and I should have thought about putting them on the same page. So I'm going to do them this way. Let's see if I can straighten this up. So I want you to do the following three questions. First, find the exact value of the cosine of the arc tangent of negative one half. Then find the exact value of the sine of the arc cosine of negative five over eight. And the cosine of the arc sine of negative five over eight. And I want you to, to see, looking at the work that you do in questions 14 and 15, and noticing here we've got a sine, arc, cosine, cosine, arc, sine, and we're putting the same angle in, the same value. Negative 5 over 8, negative 5 over 8. I want you to see what can you generalize from the results of examples 14 and 15, and then explain. So I'm just going to pause here and let you go ahead and do that problem. Actually, I'm going to let you pause. I'm going to go ahead and that's the last bit that I wanted to do. So um, I hope you're enjoying these and um, have a great day.